and welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And today I'm with Lord Snappy, and I forgot to pull up your YouTube channel. I'm doing it right now. But also, while while I'm pulling this up, we have a link for a Discord in the in the description that I'm am, I'm very very proud to be a part of. It's very it's very nerdy, and we get into all the um this deep lore. So it's like into ancient religions, ancient philosophy, ancient history, psychedelic stuff, all that good stuff. We talk about that all the time. Or it's, it's always someone in there ha having chats, and it really is fun. I really enjoy like looking at some some of the stuff people are sharing there. But also go and subscribe to Lord Snappy. You know he's put out he puts out videos. He he's got a degree in religious studies, so he's not just some random guy. He's got some background and he knows what he's talking about. And and not even on on top of the degree, you just are in the, you're so, you're so deep into this stuff that you're reading it. You're like me, you read it every night and like the degree is just like extra, but like your knowledge is where it's at. You know, this stuff, you are really well, well read in this stuff. You can hold your own with any, any of the best PhD type people in a conversation. I, I know that for a fact, just from talking to you. Oh, thank but, you so much. <laughs> yeah. Go and subscribe yeah, as, to that. As Neil was saying, I have a degree in uh, religion studies from Carleton University with a specialization in uh, Indian religions. I also did a year abroad completing um, a one-year master's in Indian philosophy with a focus on uh, Tantra. So I, ha I do have a little bit of like academia, but this is like several years out, but I've never stopped, you know. Um, my, my story is like on my YouTube channel is I do ecstatic body percussion, which is all related to this because I am a practitioner of this kind of stuff that we're going to be talking about, mainly Shaivism and Shaktiism. So, <laughs> yeah. So you see it down here. It's got body percussion shorts. You've got videos on it up here and definitely go hit that subscribe, hit the bell. I don't even have the bell on hit the bell. I just hit the bell right now. <laughs> so, um, yeah, guys, there we go. And we're going to get into this fun topic that I love. I don't, I, I wanted to get into this more when I started this channel because it has a lot to do with my own story my own personal journey into like digging into all these religions and getting getting really like kind of into it myself like it led me down the path of religion in general I was taking dmt back in the day and having these experiences and wondering what the hell just happened just and i'm like thinking there's got to be something out there this is just something greater and that was because it's like for me I'm not saying that other people had different experiences. That was for me. This is just some crazy things that I have. I have a video. I have some early videos on it talking about some of the things I experienced. And um, you can watch those later. But I want to get into it because I'm my hypothesis right now is that these ancient religions, you know, whether it be the Vedic religions, the Chinese, Indian religions or the Greco-Roman religions, the Egyptian religions. A lot of times when you go back far enough, it there's always like it always leads you to like some sort of substance they were taking, whether it be the Kaikyan or the Soma juice in the Indians in the Veda, the Vedas, the oldest text that we have. They're talking about the Soma sacrifice over and over and not just one time in some random verse. We're talking like every other passage has the word Soma in it all over the whole text. When you so get into the Vedas, the, 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 the Soma is so central. There's an entire mandal, which is like a chapter. It's the ninth mandal. And it's just devoted solely to the preparation of the Soma. And it goes through, like, we're talking hundreds of years in different, in different sages and how they did it. And they show you just every single step is meticulous and is prepared exact, you know. And it's all about this. Uh, experience that you have of this sacrifice that you go through when you ingest the soma, right? Yeah, and I, I was talking to Carl Ruck about Kaikia. I did a whole bit up his whole hour long, two hour long discussion with him, and he did a, he's a, he studied Kaikia for a long time, and they actually had the green light from a university to go and try it. They they got there they what they what they thought was the um the the recipe. They might have messed up on something. And I, I have an idea of my own personal idea of where they might have messed up. But I'm not going to get into that. But anyways, they they made their recipe. They tried it. They took it. And it was a failure. Nobody felt anything. So, <laughs> But I just thought it was interesting because the reason I brought that up is because you said it's so meticulous. It's got to be so perfect that when you if you if one thing's wrong in that recipe, the whole thing is just doesn't the ph balance goes off so, something happens where it doesn't work anymore well th it gets interesting in the indian tradition because what we clearly see is over time is a uh, the ritual gets more and more complicated and it gets more and more involved even at the beginning it's still meticulous 
But by the end, where they're no longer using the soma specifically, they're just using random plants, every single step has been elaborated and has been like developed into this whole philosophy. It gets, it gets so intense to the point where the ritual supersedes the actual psychedelic experience in the later tradition. So do you, this is what I think, I wonder about you. Do you think that most of these ancient religions that have common parental religions that we, that are dead, like the, you know, we talk about the print proto Indo European religions, how there's a sky father, this potter who, and the Indians, then Dias Potter, and then the Greeks is Jupiter. You could tell they come from a common source, but also on top of that, but on top of the linguistics and the and the stories and all that stuff and the characters, I'm thinking the reason why they got into this mindset where there's always different gods everywhere and there's spirits everywhere, and that you know dawn is some sort of special time of the day, or you know the sun or like the moon sp- stages have certain powerful aspects. I'm thinking they were taking something. Oh, well, I think, yeah. and, I, and, I, and, I, what the, and the reason why this is so this is so profound because even religion today comes from these. It, it's sort of a it's evolution over time. Even Christianity cannot escape this evolution of religious ideas. Right, and I think it's important too that we highlight this. Right, it's not just about plants. Okay, it's also about the physical changes that happen in the body and physical exertion, the effects of music. It's all about entering into right. psychedelic states. How you do that changes. And even within been, the Christian traditions that are later removing these drugs, you're still having these psychedelic yeah. states, you know? What you just said is so crazy because when I'm thinking about Ruck and the failed experiment, they didn't have like Orphic bands coming in with flutes and, 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 uh, and you know, what are, what are those, Kitharas? Yeah, they, the didn't have or they, weren't, they weren't dancing. They weren't running around Greece and looking at the, su- the, the dawn coming, the, the sun. Ra- they weren't doing anything like that. They were just sitting in a room with like a professor and a doctor. And I think this is like super, I think this is super important because within the text of the Vedas, the Soma, if it's referring to the drink, is only referenced in relation to the sacrifice or until the the properties it gives you, you know? So it's like, you cannot remove this from its ritual context. It doesn't work, right? And it, it becomes very clear that this whole thing is a part of it, right? Like, the the rishis have to go into a cave that's literally called the vagina where they block out all light and seclude themselves for a minimum of 24 hours and then on like more rigorous sacrifices sometimes upwards of a year imagine that where you're denying yourself all sensory then you're taking something with a dmt like substance that causes light and this incredible shine to happen so you're taking that and you're going out and experiencing the dawn Right, mm-hmm. you're doing the sacrifice to make the sunrise. It's it's you're going to be tripping and experiencing things on a level we can't imagine. Right, right. And then you write those things down or or orally tell them, and they get passed on, and then they get like tweaked and changed, and all of a sudden you have scripture. Exactly. But going back to what you're saying, like I'm really influenced by the um, the writings of Terence McKenna. And what we see in his writings is he goes back right to the beginning of the cave paintings. And these emerge between like 30 and 40,000 years ago, right? But prior to that, we have no art, right? Like human beings are not decorating things. Then all of a sudden there's the emergence of this art and it's everywhere. It takes over the entire human condition. And if we look at the earliest artworks, we see two things. We see mushrooms, clear reference to psychedelics. And then we see a clear reference to magic, right? I'm yeah. creating a symbol I, of something I desire, like an animal, like a deer. And then I'm putting spears in it, showing that I get the deer and I succeed. This yeah. to me is sigil magic, right? Yeah, this it's is- like you're telling yourself, I'm, my intent now is to go out and hunt and I'm going to do it. I'm going to, you know, it's like a blood pack type of thing. Like right? yeah, the act of doing that sort of pushes something inside of you to actually finish the job and do it. So what now you we- have that pack done. Once you have that down, you're going to get it. Like even people around you are going to press you. Didn't you do a sigil pack? Go, go get that animal. You better go do it. And it's like, right. and then you complete it. And everyone's like, see, it was the sigil magic the whole time. Of course. Exactly. But it doesn't really matter, right? It doesn't because matter. No, I know. Now we're getting into this magical yeah. thinking. We're getting into this ritualization. We're starting to color and interpret everything. In a sense, it's like the, it's, Magic is like the plan before the plan. You know what I mean? Right, right. right. And also, this occurs all with the development of language and all of this happening all at the same time. But what I think we see is also is that 
everywhere human beings settle across the world, no matter what, they're engaging in drug use, engaging in psychedelic states, and they're doing it in extreme in any way possible. Like, here's just a list of some of the common drugs that we find around the world, right? You have psilocybin mushrooms, right? Absolutely. Water lilies and water lotuses. This is Egypt and also India. We have cannabis, right? This is across Asia. Um, wow. The Amnita muscaria. This is across Asia, Europe, and India, right? We have ephedra across most of Asia, right? We have the ayahuasca vine that we see in South America. We have ergot, peyote, ibogagine, acacia. Those are just plants. Then if you get into things like animals, right? People are ingesting toads, snake venom. They're ingesting scorpions. Like to this day in India, people Scorpion. smoke yeah, scorpions. I, saw, okay? I, I didn't believe that until Amon showed me, Dr. Amon showed me the text. I think it was Galen or someone. It was in Greek text. And it's, they were, it's like, take the scorpion, place it into the something. It was like some sort of the device that smokes things and. They're smoking scorpions, dude. Yeah, they're smoking scorpions. They're taking honey. But it even gets more intense than that. We have several cultures, several documented evidence of this where shamans are ingesting ritual plants, then expelling the urine and having their followers ingest the urine. And what's happening is that uh, there's a, a, the toxins are being you know, processed through the shaman's body and are not getting into the lay people, right? So the wow. shaman takes the brunt of these horrible experiences. We also have evidence of people doing this with animals, such as horses and cows. And we also have evidence of sexual fluids, whether male semen or female ejaculate, right? And with urine, you're also adding in things like sugars and you're adding in all this other stuff, especially if you get into orgasms. It, it, gets, it gets really wild. These people are chemists and they're, they're doing it through trial and error and everyone's kind of doing it all around the globe, right? Yeah, for Constantly. sure. For sure. What, we, what we see emerging in the Bronze Age is like this ritualized refinement of all of these things. Mm. And like, you think it's really starting to become more systematic, you're saying, around this time? Exactly. What you're starting to see is the emergence of priest kings. You're starting to see the birth of temple complexes, right? You're starting to see these ritualized elements, right? We have the rise around 2500 BCE, right? We have the rise of Minoan Crete, and we also have the birth of the Harappan civilization. And at this time, Egypt is also like a major player. You also right. have summer, you have um, sites in Turkey, such as Gober Tepe, Indus or Valley, the, the Bactrian Margiana society, in, right? Is, is Indus Valley starting to populate by this time? Yeah, so that's a Harappan civilization. Oh, okay, all, I know what you're yeah. Yeah, all happening 2500 BCE. And what really I find intriguing is when you start to connect all of these groups, they're all somewhat trading. Now, we don't have direct trade lines, but it's clear that like the Harappan people have made it to Egypt and they've made it to Mesopotamia. And it's also clear that the Cretes have made it to Mesopotamia. So there's yeah. like this cross-cultural dialogue that's happening. Yeah. And then we also see the same symbols in the same civilizations and the same kind of ritualization around drug use, you know? Wow. So like within the Harappan civilization, we don't have massive temple complexes, but what we do have is we have a priestly caste that is elevated with a priest king, okay? Mm -hmm. That doesn't rule like a direct authority. We see the same thing paralleled in Minoan Crete. We see yeah, the you same... see the Babylonians you have this dual, this dual relationship where you have the king who's in charge of the armies. He's in charge of basically everything, but he has to be, he has to be, um, what is it called? Like, so like he has to be like, um, he's below. He's the, the only person who is sort of above the king in the Babylonian civilization is the high priest who control, who runs the temple. He runs all the religious affairs, the laws, the law codes. That's the high priest. And so every year and during the Akitu festival, and I'm not the expert. I got this from uh, Dr. Josh Bowen told me this. Mm -hmm. Every year at the Akitu festival, the entire city of Babylon would witness the king, the mighty king, who's in, probably jacked looking, probably has all the army behind him, probably mean, mean, mean. So they would watch him get smacked in the face by the high priest just to remind the society the high priest is in charge and that high priest is also in charge of the psychedelics too. Right. 
So you see these things also going on in both Minoan Crete and the Harappan civilization. What's interesting here, though, is unlike in Egypt or Sumer, you don't have these king figures, okay? You do not have this rigid authority, and you still have this connection that's clear to a shamanistic, ritualized society. The other big thing you get are these kind of yogic figures, right? More explicitly in the Harappan civilization, but in both civilizations, we have all of these seals, and on these seals are usually images of bulls and other sacrificial animals. Then you have these characters with horns, you know, and the one in the Harappan has like three faces. It looks to me, and a lot of scholars have made this connection, like, Rama. like Shiva, no, yeah, okay. Ashupati, the Lord of Beasts, right? who's also the divine yogi, right? Yeah. So you see this figure represented. The also thing you see is there's only one figure who's made into actual murtis or like physical idols. And that's this mother goddess figure. And you see the same parallel in Manoa, in Minoan Crete. Yeah. Is this focus on the Great. mother goddess. You yeah. also see all of these by the seals way, and by magic the way, amulets. Not to Go cut ahead. you off, but just so you you're you're so spot on because even in Roman times, this is Shiva by the way, even in Roman times, the great mother by the time she becomes Magda Mater in Latin, they're still calling her the Idean Mother, which is from the I Mount Ida in Crete. So she's still tied to Crete even thousands, even 2,000 years later. Right. So then, and, like, that's a big deal. But and yeah. also at Gnosis, you have this snake figure, right? You have this at the at the, at the the main um, in, in, like uh, palace complex. And a lot of scholars have, sound, have found like similarities to the Hindu goddess Manasa. And there's even a reference in the linear B, in the Greek linear B that says Manasa, you know, and this is a blind snake woman. And if you talk to Amon, he's all about finding this blind snake woman. Like, yeah, he's always talking about that. There's so many parallels. It's, 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 it's clear to me that these two civilizations at one point were one and that they split off into various parts of the world, right? And you have a, or at the very least, you have a dialogue between them. You also have labyrinths, these double-bladed axes. You have these uh, phalluses and these vagina symbols that are together, which is like our lingam in India. It's just, it's, it's wild what's going on there. So yeah. what's interesting, though, is like this all happens around 2500 BCE. You have the rise of these two civilizations, right, as well as similar civilizations. And you have this ritual emerge that in both instances seems to be focused around a combination of canna cannabis, okay, and detura and Anita muscaria, okay? But then what ends up happening is by the later period of the, uh, of the Bronze Age, we have the arrival of the Vedic peoples, okay? And the, the, the Indo-Aryans who come and they both crush the Minoan Cretes and they crush the Harappan civilization, or at least they displace. We're not sure exactly what happens, but for whatever reason, these city sites are abandoned and yep. the languages that they were, were, were promulgating are no longer in use. But it's also very clear that the religion and the ideas and all of this, stuff, it, does, it, it gets diffused into the arriving um, Indo-Aryan peoples, right? Sure. So like when we get into this, this is like is now I've, I'm completely away from the Greek. I'm not as familiar. OK, right. but when it comes to the Indian, I have a lot of more knowledge. And what we see is with the arrival of the Vedic peoples is like this incorporation of the previous Dravidian culture. We have the addition of hundreds and hundreds of deities. And we also have this transition. So in the earliest version of the Homa that we find, we find it first in the Bactrian Mariana civilization at Gober Tepe, OK, which is like Afghanistan kind of area. And what we see them doing there is they're taking the Syrian rue and cannabis. And they're they're using both of these and they're making Syrian rue. I have an extra bag left over. Right? <laughs> ephedra. You know, they're using ephedra, and it's very clear there's talk of pressing these stalks to make a juice. And the juice is like a um, it's a it's a virulent, it makes you like uh, pumped up and aggressive and being able to fight. Yeah. But it's also clear, like, when we look at the Avestan texts and we look at the Vedic texts, there are, there are more than one drug going on here. There's a drug to get you into battle. There's a drug to make you see God. There's a drug to make you commune with God. 
but they're all referred to by the same name. But the context is clear, though. And there's even like color differentiations that happen when you get right down into the language and when you get into the symbols surrounding various gods and goddesses. Like certain gods would be called for certain drinks. And it gets like super complicated. And also we're having this like, you have this society that is mobile, right? They're a horse culture and a cow culture. And they're moving from, you know, the mountainous regions of like Afghanistan and they're coming into India. The drugs are changing. Everything is changing. So I think why, why we're having such a trouble with, with Soma is that it goes from being the Syrian Ru, the ephedra, which you can find in the mountainous regions of the Himalayas, to it, it starts to kind of disappear. OK, and, and its availability is not as widespread. And then what happens is you get this process of syncretization where the ritual gets exposed, where it kind of gets demystified and set out to, to, to the general public. Even as the Brahmins, they try to keep it internal. It doesn't stay that way. It's very clear that like the Buddha and the Mahavira and all of these other sages that arrive later and are critical of the Vedas are aware of the Soma ritual, they they know what's going on, and they're either dismissing it or they're incorporating it in a different way. You right. know, so okay, that's what, what I was wondering. Like, so what, what, what happens? So Terry McKenna talks about this a lot, and I think he's largely right. What happens is it's it's probably a type of ephedra or a type of grass that has DMT, and it gets over harvested as this information becomes more public. And people just start taking it because they're not cultivating it. There's this whole thing within the Vedic text about it has to be from the wilderness. It has to be wild. And you see this even today with other shamanic groups, like with ayahuasca, right? They don't want to cultivate these plants. They want them to be wild. But in the case of the Vedas, this becomes their, their downside, you know? And then what we see is this ritualization. We see the Soma ritual become the main focus. And we, we also see this shift where... We're still seeking, the, seeking this DMT experience, but we're now doing it alchemically with our bodies through a combination of yoga and sexual practice, as well as drugs. But the drugs are a little bit more hidden, you know? Yeah. So do you think there's something going on where, well, because you made a good point. Like, they don't have mass production of these drugs like they did in a lab like today. They're, they're basically subserve, sub, 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 they basically have to, go with what's around them, like what's growing, like where they can find it. Like they might run out of a certain area where it's growing wild or something. But do you think maybe over time it becomes something that's like just for priesthoods, like the high priest controls it and only his clique has it. And the regular population is no longer in touch with this sort of ritual anymore. And now it's just following the text and like just doing like things because they're, they're told to. Do you think maybe that's what's happening? Oh, it's very clear that that's what's happening. So what we have is like, we have this, um, at the same time that the, the Soma starts to get used up and start to disappear, right? We have this complete reaction to Brahmanism and to the caste system. And we have the emergence of the Shramanas, which are the reactionary enlightenment uh, religious groups that arrive in contrast. Also, we see an evolution in Hinduism, where Hinduism is now kind of reincorporating and, and, and reimagining the Vedas in a philosophical way. We get the emergence of the Upanishads and the Rishi sages who do that, who talk about this. And there's yeah. like a clear conversation happening between like the earlier Dravidian Shaivites, which predated the Vedas and the Vedic people. And then as well as the Buddhists and the Jains and these other groups that are arriving. So basically within this period of 600 to 200 BCE, you have this wild philosophical emergence. You have all of this dialogue. And this is why like the Sanskrit becomes so important. Everyone is writing in Sanskrit. They're debating the Veda. They're debating the importance of the sacrifice. And what defines one as Hindu is whether or not they accept the authorities of the Vedas. And what, what becomes really interesting is it's not the Vedas specifically that they're talking about, but the philosophical interpretation of such. Almost all modern Hindu schools to this day don't go back to the original Vedas. They don't go to the Rig. They go to the Upanishads, which are commentaries upon right. the Rig Veda. You, you know? know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of the Upanishads kind of reminds me of like a Talmud. And the, the Vedas is like a, a Torah, a Torah Tanakh. No, no, the Rig Veda is a Torah. 
then you have the other Vedas, Sama Veda, and all that. That's that's the Tanakh, right? I'm just and, and I, this is I'm not saying this is its case. I'm just I'm just using I, these ideas to compare religions, right? So you have their Tan Tanakh Torah in the West with the Judaism. You also have a Talmud, which is a commentary on the Tanakh. But then you had this New Testament that comes out of it, and it's it reminds you of the Dhammapada, where you have this character Buddha. He's coming out of that Vedic tradition 100%, but he's also critical of it, and he flips it on its head, exactly. sort of like how Jesus does. So I, <clears throat> the arc is a very similar. Western religions and Eastern religions have a very similar re religious uh, evolution arc. It's fascinating. 100%. It really is. 100%. It's it's wild to see when you, when you really start to parallel. Like, you see the same thing, this elitism, this ritualization, this... Um, this uh, loss of the sacred and it's all about you know going to the ritual you have to go through the priestly caste in order to have access but then what you wind up seeing is you see the reaction to that you get jainism which is like no 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 you can achieve enlightenment on your own same thing with buddhism right but these are all about the alchemical processes in the body right but even within these tech within these groups we still have psychedelics they're just downplayed and they're seen as tools to be used in relation to yoga yoga becomes the the main force for enlightenment but like i honestly you see the buddha all the time the buddha is under a bodhi tree the bodhi tree is used by the by the indus valley sieve as part of their dmt experience right mm -hmm. you see you see the the buddha is always, that mean he's under the influence right? of that maybe? you see the buddha with all of um the the lotuses right yeah. and you see all these indian you broke up oh you're back you're back you're back okay yeah but yeah you see all these you see the the the, the buddha achieves enlightenment under the bodhi tree and then a snake comes over him to sh cover him from the from the uh, to shield him from the weather like this could be reference to snake venom. And then also you have um, references to, to like uh, all of these like lotus drugs, like blue and red lotus. And there's this understanding that each lotus causes like a different effect. Like one will make you more, more aggressive. One will make you see things. It's like these drugs continue, but they just evolve and they get, it becomes different. The main focus becomes on the pranayama and on the extension of these trips, you get stoned and then you want to extend them for as long as possible. And yeah. it becomes all of this thing, like they get right into like, I can make my uh, pituitary gland produce DMT and have the DMT go down my spine and I can be in a permanent state of bliss, you know? Oh, like when that, you get into the cola. That's the, high priest. that's the high priest you want. You want right? a high priest who's continually on DMT 24 seven, 365 days a year. Well, that's how these guys, like, one of the things you'll see these yogis do, right, is they'll be so stoned on DNT, right, through these yoga practices that they can destroy their body. And they'll do this as, like, the body means nothing. It's meaningless. So watch as I stand here and let I my think, arm rot. Let I, it just yeah, that's what I just said. Way. I think you can become detached from reality from that. Yeah, totally Weird. detached yeah. from reality. You become totally stuck in the dream, right, right. in a sense. And, like, and for anyone, me, for anyone, for anyone who doesn't know, DMT, the best way to describe it is dreaming while you're awake. Right. I think that's the, the most simple way to describe it. Like you just go into a dream state, period. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but go ahead. Exactly, right? Like you're going into and you're entering into these, these uh, states where you're, where you're experiencing consciousnesses separate of your own, okay? Yeah. And these are disembodied forms that appear like lattice work. Like you told me about your psychedelic trip. And it appears like a lattice work. It's the same mm. kind of colors, the same shining lights. You see people reacting to this all over, right? Like very, the very reason fluid. why. Go very ahead. Fluid. No, I just said very fluid sort of. Right. Thing. Moving. You know, and you'll see people with multiple heads and multiple arms because the idea is that these gods are are existing in multiple dimensions, four dimensions instead of three, right? And they appear like a lattice work inside of our brain. <laughs> yeah, it would be like entering another dimension that like it'd be like a 2d oh. 2d creature trying to understand the third dimension just like an another layer of reality right? that's an, almost impossible to uh describe um, the other thing to focus on here too with with these rituals is what is the purpose 
what are these people doing? What are they trying to do with this Kekion, with this Soma, with this Datura and stuff? And this is where I want you to play that video by uh, Brian Murarescu. Sure. This this directly goes into that. Yep, I will. This is interesting. Uh, I love Terrence McKenna. I just think he's just, whether you think he's legit or you think he's crazy, he's fascinating regardless. So we're going to play this video. Can you see the screen? Yep. Okay. <laughs> Oh, I think it's silent or you can't hear it. No, you can't hear it at all. No, really? Oh, um, hold on a second. Let me see if I can turn this volume up somehow. All right. Now, how about this? Is that no, nothing, nothing for me. <laughs> You're not hearing anything at all. Hold on, try this now. Nothing at all. Nothing. Really, Chad? Are you, <laughs> Chad, are you hearing it? No, no sound here either. What is going on? What Weird. the heck? <laughs> um, Doesn't want us to watch Brian Marescu. <laughs> oh, let, me, let me see something real quick. I think there's, I think there's a way around this real quick. Hold on a second. Speakers. Um, let me see. Okay, let me just try this then. Let me know if you can hear this now. No. Nothing? All right, let me try this then. No. No, that's not gonna work. Uh shit. What is going on? I don't I don't I really don't know. I have the volume on. Volume is all the way up. Uh I don't know why it's not playing sound. That's so weird. Audio. Automatic. Okay, so let me try this then. Speakers. Let me try this. All right, maybe this is the last. If this doesn't work, I don't know what else is going to work. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, I'll no, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> so weird. Maybe we post that link in the chat and tell people to watch it on their own. Yeah, that's what we'll do. I'll just do that. Yeah. So, yeah. um, I I don't know why it didn't work, but uh, here, there's the link mm. in the chat. Uh, sorry about that. I really don't know what happened. I was, I've tried every setting I could, man. Like. Yeah, no worries. It's all good. These things happen. But the key anyway to that video and what Brian really gets at is like, what are these rituals really about? And we see these direct parallels within the Vedas to the to the to the Orphic rites, to the to all these different traditions. And it seems to be that there's this um, returning aspect. Right. So like you're engaging in a sacrifice in order to return back to a primal moment. It's about going, it's about having a death experience and returning almost to the one so that you can go back and be reborn again, come out of the womb. So like within the Orphic cosmogony, right? You return to the protogonos. You oh, return to the golden egg. You I'm going to one up you on that. I'm reading this book right now by Peter Kingsley. It's about Parmenides. And Parmenides was a Phocaean, um philosopher and theologian who came who they, when they were fleeing the persians they this entire city went and relocated in southern italy which is at the time magna gratia or you know now it's in southern italy anyways long story short they had these rituals of it was like a they're called incubation rituals where they would go into a cave they would go into this incubate incubation state and dream and meet Asclepius and Apollo and Nyx. Those are the three gods they kept mentioning. Nyx, the goddess of night, Apollo, the god of oracles, and then Asclepius was the healer. So if you were sick, they would bring you into this incubation. They would put you to sleep, and then you would meet Asclepius. He would heal you. And this was a this was like they were taking this was not a joke. They were taking this so seriously. Parmenides was the one was the one who was like really leading these these uh, rites. And it's the same thing as like the idea of dying and rebirth going into the cave going into the womb and coming back out but also right. like in a healing sense you would be renewed and you'd be a new person after that that's how they right. that's, how, that's how they treated it and so yeah, i'm in that that theme it's a total right? rebirth experience right like there's all this talk about you have to die in this life 
in order to experience aeonic life, right? It's not eternal life in a heaven. It's about eternity in the moment, okay? Right. And it's about, yeah, in the, like this is where it parallels with the enlightenment experiences. What is the Buddha doing, right? He's achieving moksha. He's burning out the candle, right? He's extinguishing the flame. He's dying the true death. But by dying the true death in that moment, you escape the cycle of death and rebirth that you see in all of these groups, right? Like it's, it's the same thing over and over again. You see these people, they recognize that we're stuck within the cycle of constantly um, expansion and return and expansion and return. And you have to break free of this cycle. And it is through the drugs. And it's through this process of returning back into the womb, back to the monad and experiencing the unity in the moment, in that infinite moment, right? Yeah. You gain your ionic life. And it's the same in the Hindu scriptures. It's the same in the Orphic scriptures. Yeah, but you even see this reflecting in Christianity with the idea of there being, you know, the, a second birth and uh, the high priest, Chi I think it's Caiaphas, he says, what do you mean? Am I supposed to go back into the womb and come back out? And he was like, until you until you have your, uh, re until you face the second birth, you cannot enter the kingdom. Like, it's about rebirth. You know what I mean? It's a, right. a concept. You even see this, the concept of the Eucharist where it, you know, you're, it's the vine, which would be Dionysus, and then the the grain, which would be Demeter, and you're eating the body and the blood of Jesus. Right. But yeah. that, that concept comes, you see that concept in all yeah. the Orphic mysteries too. Right? And like, this is at the heart of the Shaivite mysteries, right? Which are like the oldest Indian tradition. So in the Indian traditions, you have basically, or at least in Shaivism, you have two primal deities. You have Shiva who is representative of consciousness. And it, consciousness is seen as like this immobile thing. It's pure bliss. It, it can't be reached. It can only be interacted with, right? So the idea is how do we get to this pure bliss of consciousness, pure consciousness? How do we reconnect with timelessness, which Shiva is? We do it through time. What is time? Time is Kali. Time is the goddess as her absolute lover, Parvati. What is Parvati? the kundalini energy that comes up our spine, that connects us back to the divine. And when we look at the myths of poverty, what is poverty? Real quick, real quick I got something to say about that. That's because that's yeah. really important because also in the Greek world, you have Apollo, who is also called destroyer. Apollo Olos is, a, is one of his titles, destroyer and healer. And so, and he, and he is represented in the Delphi, temple of Delphi, you know, is the one who fights the serpent, but the serpent's also still incorporated. So you have the serpent like the Kundalini, but you also have Apollo inside of Shiva. So there's right. like, a, you see like a complete mirror of the tradition over on the other side of the world, like doing the same, but the same function, basically. The same In the same imagery, like this is from India, okay? This is a obsidian egg or a Shiva right, like the orphic egg with the with That's the wrapped with the snake. It's wow. the same literal imagery. So from you a have, different so, cultural context. So with that being said, you have to wonder, is this really there's I'm just saying, I'm not I can't prove this, but I'm my hypothesis would be that these cultures are they have a common source between above them. They're both coming out of a certain culture and they're getting these ideas trickled down in different yeah. ways. But you can see how similar they are. Even in yeah, the for sure. Country, you know, like and I have my own ideas about this, right? Like there's the scholarly approach that you can take, which says that they had to have come from an original tribal source and that they're maintaining these traditions across culturally. And that, you know, there is a dialogue that while we don't have a lot of evidence, had to have been there. But then there's also the more spiritual approach that I like to take, which is that all of these cultures are reacting to the same global phenomenon. You know, right. they're reacting to the same energies and they're interpreting them in similar ways, right? Like there's a reason why you're seeing these figures and it doesn't necessarily have to be through direct communication. It could just be through the human experience of the divine world, you know? Yeah, I'm just I'm just pulling up an image of the Orphic egg, just in case anyone has no idea. You just showed us um, an egg from, what is that called again? Just show it one more this time. This is the Shiva Lingam from, Shiva from Lingam. India. It's All an right. obsidian, obsidian, which is the sacred stone of Saturn even, right? Wow. Like, now check this out. The orphan. <laughs> That's this is all the way over in, in in ancient Greece. Another ancient symbol called the Orphic egg. So, 
and it's also a sim. It has the same same kind of uh, pur purpose too, if I'm not mistaken. Doesn't same it? purpose, same idea, right? It's this rising of the Kundalini energy. It's about returning back to the egg. How do you get back to the egg through the rising of this energy? What is this energy? Parvati, the yeah, mother goddess. The serpent symbolizes shedding. The serpent symbolizes getting younger. Over Shedding time. the skin. It's yeah. time, right? The egg time. is timelessness. The snake oh, is true. time. How that's do you return true. through the process of time? What does time do? You're in a constant state of death and rebirth. Every second of every moment, you are dying and being reborn. Here's right? the kicker. Here's the kicker. <laughs> this is the nail in the coffin. Both of these traditions have some, some form of karma and reincarnation where you have in the, in the West, it's called Pythagoras calls it the transmigration of the soul. So mm -hmm. you die and then you go into another body and you become something else. You become another person or something. But in the East, they have the same sort of um, concept, but they call it reincarnation. They both right. have the same thing. It's the same idea. And the purposes are the same, right? The one becomes many so that it can know itself, so that it can experience the infinity of reality and return back to the one and share that in delight, right? This is play. The gods are at play. You see this in the Greek. You see this in the Indian, right? It's like, <laughs> this is what it's all about. And again, like going back to that Parvati thing, Parvati is this energy. So when we look at Parvati, how does she awaken the Shiva in the myth? Okay, it's through a combination of austerity and drug use. She starves herself only eating the seeds of the lotus. And then when she's at her weakest, she stops even eating the lotus and it's then, in her most desperate state, that Shiva awakens inside her. And this is what they're showing us, right? That the key to awakening that Kundalini is through going through a death state. You have to sacrifice yourself. You have to starve yourself. You have to engage in drug use, austerities and drugs. And it's the same, no matter what tradition you go through. It's always a painful process. These shamans, they go through fucking hell. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm, I just popped, this just popped into my head. I'm just thinking of something right now. When you look at the images of Apollo and Dionysus in some of these ancient Greek depictions, they, they, they appear, I guess in, this is a modern term for this, non-binary. Would that be a correct term? That you, you, they, they, you can almost, you can they almost say it like, they looks like a woman or you, it looks like, and I'm not saying that like to like, that's like weird. I'm just saying like, that's how they look. But also, and the reason why I'm bringing this up, when you look at Shiva and Krishna, you get the same. They well, both kind of have that. Like they look that they look. They don't look like Dinah. Yeah. They look different, but they also had that same trait where you're like. So with, with Krishna, it's a bit different. He's, yeah. he's the embodiment of youth and beauty. Okay, but yeah. with Shiva, with Shiva, we're operating on something entirely different. Okay, Shiva is blue. Because he drinks the poison of the great snake Vasuki and he turns the poison into an ingredient which he adds to the Soma, to the Amrit, to grant all the gods eternal life, right? Wow. And like the androgyny of Shiva is because he combines with his Shakti, his goddess, and they form one person, the Adranahari Ishvara. Right. So Shiva is a non-binary character. He is male and female. Like Kali is the active force of time. It's it comes out of Shiva. It's Shiva's embodied active form. Right. Shiva is timelessness. Kali is time. But they are directly related. Right. And when you see the various iterations of the goddess, it's because the power of the god. Right. It, it manifests in a variety of ways and it takes on an infinite amount of shape. But the God himself remains true as the eternal yogi. Or you'll see him in the act of creation, again, androgynous, engaged in his sacred dance as Shiva Nataraj. Right. Yeah. Where he's both creating and destroying the universe simultaneously. And you know? both, both of these gods are connected with the serpent and connected with. Uh, being called destroyers they both that's the title for shiva the destroyer it's also a title for apollo and they both have sort of they're both depicted in this way where they're very they look very gentle and calm and very beautiful very mm -hmm. like they're not like it's not like you're looking at like um i don't know zeus or something like there's a, there's a certain particular look that these gods are given and i wonder if there's 
that's something they have in common. So the, the interesting thing, again, like with the Indian gods, you get the same idea as you see with the Greek gods, where they'll take on epithets and they'll take on different personalities. So you're approaching the gods in a different guise, right? So Shiva is the lord of yogis. is very different than Shiva is lord of the dance, or Shiva is Adrenari Ishvara, or Shiva as like um, Bhairava, the destroyer. Right. So like or Rudra, the one who ruins the ritual sacrifice or the, who's also the howler, you know, like these gods have all of these different forms. So he's only really beautiful in, at certain times in certain places. Right. Like the figure you were showing, he's known as like the divine medicant. That's right before he gets married to Parvati. And because Parvati basically has to fucking beg him to look presentable to her family. <laughs> you know, so it's like you get this. What I see with uh, Shiva is. He's a direct, almost direct correlation between two gods, Dionysus and Saturn, okay? Within the Orphic hymns, he takes on this timelessness, this original desire that causes the egg to crack and to shatter, right? And that is the Saturnian aspect of him. But then and, when he incarnates- and also Shiva, if you take that word Shiva and, and, and transliterate it, and I'm not even saying translate it, transliterate it over into- Western religion, Western Semitic tongues, Shev, Sheva, seven. So you're like, that's kind of a weird coincidence. Shiva and seven. It's the same name. It's the same word as the, as the number seven in Hebrew. Seven is the God. Uh, Sheva is the day of the week that you um, worship either Saturn or El. So there's that connection too. Of course, like you see all these connections and lots of people have connected like Shiva, El, Set, Saturn, like this is a very common thing that you see scholars doing, and as well as Shiva and Dionysus, because Shiva has a dualistic form. Okay, so at one point he's the timeless yogi, right, who exists removed, who causes time to start through his violence, very Saturnian, but at the same time he incarnates into the world as the divine madness, as the wine, as the vine itself. That's crazy. And they use this language. That's right? there's so much in common. And my, so I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna go right for the jugular with this um with this comparison and you're about to watch you I think you're gonna agree with me on this. Check this out. There's a god who comes out of Crete, by the way, out of all places. Crete, Sabatios. Sabatios is not only identified with Saturn or 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 Zeus as the Sky Father type, but he's also identified with Dionysus. So there you go. You have a God that's just this is like, our, yeah, this is, like this is clear, yeah. clear to me that there's a parallel between these two figures because we've already shown look, look how it, much it. overlap is happening between Crete. I didn't even know this. I just pulled this up. Look at Sabatios's name has been connected with the Indo-European Suwa, Suwo. Now that's how close is that to Shiva? W, you know how W and V is are, are uh, interchangeable. And then sure. vowel, all vowels are interchangeable. All you got to do is tweak that a tiny bit. You got Siva, Shiva. No, it's true. There's, there's, That's crazy. I didn't, I didn't even plan that out. I just pulled, I'm just looking at what this website says. This is it's, like, it's, it's clear. Out. And I mean, if you talk to Dr. Amon, he will tell you uh, like with certainty that Dionysus and Saturn are analogous, right? Like Saturn is the incarnation or sorry, uh, Dionysus is the incarnation, you know, like they're related to this Ooh. original cult. Dude, I think we found the connection, dude. Mm -hmm. wow. That's what I mean, right? We're, we're, what I've been doing and what I'm always looking for is this original Bronze Age rite this, that's both psychedelic and sexual that causes one to die and be reborn, right? Wait, what, she, what does Shiva mean in, in Sanskrit? Um, let me just look this up quickly because I want to be 100% sure. Yeah, because right here, this whoever wrote this particular passage in encyclopedia.com and saying suo means his mm -hmm. own so literally it means um the auspicious one okay? okay okay or it could mean the red one if it comes from the tamil um so there's a lot of like confusion over the etymology sure. of it yeah. because also like within the earliest text right the vedas that we have he's referred to as rudra the howler and then Shiva is an epithet that's added later. So we imagine that uh, the uh, Indo-Aryan people, the Vedic people, were, were were trying to display Shiva, were reacting to Shiva, and they made him lower, and Look they called that. him Rudra. But then later on, 
his earlier epithet of Shiva reasserts itself. Listen to this. More recently, George Musso has translated Sabatios as sap god from the Indo-European sap, taste, perceive. Uh, this no corresponds to the pattern of Dionysus Sabatios, who is the divinity of humidity and such connected with both vegetation and intoxication. Boom. Right. It's the intoxication. Shiva is the divine madness. He is intoxication itself. And then you, you have know? you have <laughs> Saba, both Saba and Shiva sort of connected with the Sabbath and seven. Yeah, exactly. There's so much to be said about that. There's, there's so much, right? Yeah. Like there's this big, you know, I understand why people do it. And I do think that there is something to every culture's iteration of all these understandings, right? And there's something to the various ways we, we arrive at these positions. But I feel like too much in our modern conception, we've tried to separate everyone. And we've tried to separate these religions into their own boxes where they're not interacting. No, And right. it's, it's so foolish. Like we all came out of fucking Africa. If you go yeah. back far than us, we're all one, right? right? Like you can, there's clear to me, like we are reacting to the same elements over and over and over again, you know? No, that's a very good point. Really good point. The same concepts and stuff. Exactly. Um, I don't know how much more you wanted to say on this. There are super chats, but we can, if you still have more you want to say, but I'm take, take um, let me just see here. So do, 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 do. what would I want to get at? Oh, just that, like, what we see in the later Indian traditions, right, is is not a stopping of this psychedelic, of this psychedelic school, but a complete revolution of the psychedelic approach, where it's becoming an internalized alchemical process, as well as a drug one. And a lot of people fail to see this, like, we have this conception now with, like, Hatha Yoga, that, like, everything is, a, is austere, and it's about physical control but if you read Patanjali he's still talking about the drugs and he cites the drugs as an authentic way to get there and he even recommends the drugs to students you know so it's like we're seeing this ongoing co the conversation happening and I think even in India what we see is that once you get into the colonial period right? There's this process that happens in India of a mask, like where the British emasculate the Indians. They just attack them for everything. They point at anything that their culture deems unworthy and highlights it and says that this, this is the worst fucking shit imaginable. So what we see is that this vilification of the drugs and this vilification of the Soma has this intrinsic impact across India. And at the same time, you're seeing all of these Indian traditions that are now about the internal alchemy. They've moved away from the drugs, right? They're not as focused on them or they're using them in conjunction, right? So when we're now coming back and we're looking for the Soma, you're getting this reaction, right? The Indian yeah. people are saying, well, it can't just be one drug because we have hallucinogenic experiences. We have experiences of extreme strength and vigor. Like how can it be a mushroom? Also, you're missing the point, right? The Brahmins are arguing about the ritual. They're not arguing about the Soma. Why is that? right? It's the ritual that's important and the drugs are interchangeable. Within the Brahmanias, which is like a commentaries on the Vedas, we have several options for drugs that you can take at, like, that are different. Like we have um, Phalaris grass is one of them that's, that's talked about and um, Syrian rue and a couple other things. Another thing we see in the Vedas too is like a vilification of the mushroom. And what I think this is, is again, it's a sign of this conflict between the Shaivite Dravidian religions, which are mushroom and cannabis based, and then the uh, Vedic religions, which are wine and ephedra or like soma based, you know? Yeah. You're getting all of this happening all at once, right? That's another thing that you, that you just reminded me of that you said about the vilification of certain things. A lot of the Vedic stuff... <clears throat> gets completely flipped on its head in the Persian religion where the, the devas are now, I think they, they're they become good. Whereas in the devas yeah. are evil. So this is this, are you familiar with the scholar Elaine Danilu at all? I've heard He's of him. Yeah. Really interesting scholar. He, so where I'm getting a lot of the stuff on Shiva and Dionysus is from him. And he makes some really interesting um, scholarly like arguments in this regard. So he thinks Asura, that word literally means no wine. Okay. And what you're seeing is you're seeing a group with the wine and then a group with drugs and they're coming together and they're combining and you have, their you have drugs. The purity culture and then the hippie culture and they're 
they're they're well, coming kind of, together so in the right. ritual. You and, and I, you and I know what team we're on. You and I both are on the hippie, right? Team. <laughs> exactly. But what's happening is you're seeing this. There's this dialogue, and we have versions of this. So there's this myth in the Indian text called the Samudra Mantam, and I've talked about this before in Amon's channel. Like this is about how the gods churn the ocean of its milk in order to produce the Amrit. Okay, which is the 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 immortality key, right? And uh, they do it through this combined sharing of stuff, and then they take their drugs and they they hate each other and they they fuck off again. And we have versions of the Samudra Mantam in the Vestan languages that continue in their own way, where it's not it's it's the uh, the devas that are the problem. Right. The Davis are the bad guys. The Davis abandoned the drug. We kept it, you know, but you get the it's, it's like it's to me what it is, is like there were once one culture and then there was like a fight about how you're supposed to do this ritual. And then there's a split that occurs. Yeah. You know, and where it gets really muddy, though, is because when the split occurs, they evolve. They, it's not like they, they stopped evolving. The Homa travels down into Iran and takes on its own evolutionary bent. And then the Soma travels to India and takes on its own evolutionary bent. And what they were in the beginning is not what they are in the end anymore. You know, yeah. but we have all these texts that we're going to that can trace themselves back to the original. And this well, is, so we're, we're muddying all these waters, right? Well, that seems to be the, 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 the thing that happens when a religion comes out of another religion. It polemicizes the one before it. It yeah. flips it on its head completely, and like those yeah. de those devas that we're talking about, you get the you get the same thing in the Western world where you have the the is the day is it the the dios the devas devas, they're, but they're the gods. You have the Olympians, and then you have the te the titans. The titans, yeah. And it's the same. It's the same twelve titans and twelve whatever. You see the same numbers and the same sort of like traits they have. The same like etymology mm -hmm. sometimes, but not always. But like sometimes. But you see, you can see the commonality, the overlap between the two. But notice too, right? Like the Greeks have this understanding between the Chthonian and the Olympian, right? What is Dionysus? He's Chthonian. What is Shiva? Chthonian. Who is Saturn? Chthonian, Titanic. These are an older tradition that's been supplanted, but is still there, right? It's so that's like, that's like earthly, right? Like they're like. Yes, they're, yeah. they're underworld based. They're more about spirits of the dead, spirits of the ancestors, right? And again, they're focused Prometheus. on these like, yogic okay. wilderness practices. Yeah, Prometheus, right? Father this, of mankind, the, right. Exactly. And again, it's about in these beginning, these earlier, I feel like what we're seeing is when the when the proto-Aryan peoples come in and they migrate into Greece and they migrate into India, you get this co-mingling that happens, which is both antagonistic and cooperative, you know? So the gods get incorporated, but they're seen as less than, you know, the previous gods. They're, they're, they don't get completely removed. They just get reinterpreted and reimagined. You see right. similar things happening in the Christian tradition, right? Like the goddess Brigid becomes a saint, St. George, right? Like right. these are clear deity figures that then just become euhemerized, right? Yeah. This is an ongoing, pro you see this with the, the, the Jewish tradition and the, the religions all around them, you know? Uh, I mean, that's a lot more debatable, but I would say it's happening. This this process of euhemerization and of, of, of co-mingling and like reasserting the power, right? Like what happens is the Aryans take the ritual and they say, we are the ones who possess it. And we have the secret to it. And you have to come through us. Right. Right. And what happens within um, the Greek tradition is you get this splitting of all these mystery cults you know, who try to keep these rituals to themselves, but also share it, right? And you right. get the development of these grand temple complexes. In yeah. India, what happens is the, the Soma kind of, the, the information gets dispersed throughout everyone. And you get hundreds of different religious and philosophical movements that are all incorporating it and interpreting it in their own way, you know? Yeah, absolutely. But they're still all reacting to that original ritual, that original sacrifice, this same idea of returning back to the monad, to the embryo, right? It seems to be the common denominator is the, is a sort of concept of dying and res rebirth. Yep. And that's like, and the Christianity takes that concept and magnifies it and, and makes it about, that makes a, the, your salvation depends on believing in, in this one thing rather than you actually going through the rebirth and resurrection 
that's that's the difference between this sort of state worldwide universal church and like these like honed in mystery religions that have look at also what you see with christianity right it's clearly a mystery religion but what it has done is it 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 has monopolized the mystery it tells you that all the drugs are bad tells you all the other mysteries are lies and they're satanic and they need to be disparaged and you have to go through us to achieve them it's so ironic it really is you see the same thing trying to happen in india but you get people like the buddha who rebel against this in an insane way you know and That's you see the same thing in the West, right? You get your Martin Luthers. You get, you you know, like. Yeah. That's such a good point. I really, yeah, that's, and that, and that seems to be the arc of religious evolution. It always seems to be things are going a certain way. Things get stale. A figure comes out and says, no, we're going to change. This is the new way now. And then that arc starts. And it's not Honestly, even, it's not even that they get deified. Like, like you said, Martin Luther, he's not a God or anything. No. He sort of does the same thing as he's. These Buddha right. Jesus figures do. You see this happen again and again. And to me, like I'm getting a little mystical again here, but I go into this psych, the cyclic idea of history. You see this in Avicenna. You see this in Carl Jung, which is this idea that you have these cycles of cultural products and, and, and cultures in general where they run their course and they start to consume themselves. So what hap- perfect example is to look at Jung, right? And, and what he talks about for the German culture. In the beginning, you have the Gothic tribes, right? They're yeah. Dionysian. They have all this strength and all this power. And what do they do? They sack Rome, right? They take over the fucking empire. Got then the they evolve and they become Apollonian. They produce the heights of Western art. You know, we get all this incredible advancement, but then it yeah. starts to calcify. It starts to consume itself. The powers that be won't relinquish power. It starts to become corrupted and you start to see the rise of the world wars and the rise of fascism right? You see this decay and you see the same thing happening with religious ideas. You see the same thing happen with musical ideas. It's like these cycles are human evolution. New ideas come out, they achieve a grandiose grandiosity, and then they run their course and they die out. But if wow. they don't die, they become cannibalistic and they need to be overthrown. They, yeah, they become real problematic. And also, right? they become, like you said, they become fascist. They become Saturnian, yeah, right? that the father eating his own children. Exactly. That's the heart of all of this, right? And what do we need to do? We need to overthrow Saturn. And this is why a lot of people. So this is what the this is what the ancients were noticing, and they were anthropomorph anthropomorphizing these things and turning them into these grand mythologies. But really, yeah. they're the really what they are is they're a true commentary on the world. Exactly. And it's these cycles that keep happening. They keep noticing it, and they just. Write it into a myth, and all of a sudden we notice that things that are happening are really weirdly like connect. Like they really they sound a lot like this myth of Saturn, for example. Right. Or well, what is it that what is at the heart of these myths? If you really deep down, if you meditate on them, and you try to get into it, what you see is that this is people trying to understand the nature of violence. They're trying to relate to the violent world in which we live in. The reality is, if you just sit here and do nothing, you will decay and rot and die. The violence will overcome you. And the only thing we can do to resist violence is to be in a state of evolution and change, to constantly be pushing ourselves forward, to be engaged in that sacrifice, right? What were the, When the Vedas are talking about the sacrifice, what does it do? It perpetuates creation forward, right? By going back to the one, we're also pushing us in to this grander, ever-expanding evolution. You know, so I feel like our ancestors, they're reacting to this constant state of violence and they're trying to understand it. What is it? What is the purpose of it? Why is why do we need to evolve? Why do we need to ever push forward? And then that's where we get this thing about, well, we're evolving to a point where we can experience everything and then we can overcome that Saturnian force and return back to the one. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That progressive, we need to resist that force of decay. That force yeah, you got, that, that, that progressive spirit is the word. Right? Like, that's like the now. What would you compare that progressive spirit? The always trying to be better, always trying to fix what's what's wrong in the world, always trying to do to, to, to like move forward and not just stay in one spot. Because if you think about it, people who are conservative today, you throw them in a world two hundred years ago, they'd be the liberals. They'd be the ones like this is wrong. We need to fix. It. Of course. But this like, is the, this there's is always the, going to be that progressive spirit, and there's always going to be that conservative spirit. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not trying. I'm not saying it's all political. I'm, but I'm saying, mm-hmm. what do you, what do you, what would you compare that to? 
as far as like deities or anything. Well, I honestly believe that that progressive spirit is the Shiva Saturn, right? Okay. The Shiva Saturn, like if you look at the, those texts, right, they describe this golden age. Even in the, in, the, in the Hindu text, they talk about a time, this primordial wilderness, when people were at a state of peace, right? And there was this equality. But what we also get is like this understanding that this can come again, right? And there's this polar magic that is involved with both the Shaivite tradition and the Saturnian tradition, where you're trying to reset the poles. That which is on the bottom will be upon the top. This is the great magic, right? It's this revolution, this constant evolutionary cycle. Shiva is all about that. The new, push forward, change. Shed the old skin. Yeah. Right? You know what? the snake. Yeah, and I noticed yeah. something. The only way you get to Shiva is through time. You have to experience the violence of time. You have to suffer at his hands and be consumed by him. Wow. <laughs> Interesting. Right? You know, I just thought about this too, because like when you look at early Christianity, Acts chapter five talks about how everybody who joined the church would take their wealth. They would sell their property. They'd sell their house. They would take all their money and they'd throw it into a, at the, hand, the feet of the apostles. And, you know, there's actually evidence that this is actually really happening because second century author, second century Christian writer, Harpocrates writes that in the Christian communities in Alexandria, it was the same way. Everybody shared their property um, in commonality. And if you well, came in, if you came into the, to, to the society of the Christians in Alexandria, you basically gave your wealth up and then you were you were you had access to all the wealth that was within the community. Long story short, the reason why I bring that up is because now and I'm not saying all Christians are this way, but it's it's the case, at least in America, where Christianity is this like pro capitalist, pro conservative, pro completely flipped this whole idea on its head. Those I, those the, the way of life of Christianity is not is the exact opposite of what right. it was in the early days. Because what you're seeing, right, is in the early days, it was Dionysian. It was wild. It was magical. It was ugly. But now yeah. it's conservative. It's stagnant. It's regressive. And it's consuming us, mm. right? It's consuming everything around it. It resists change at every yeah. second, right? Look at the current it's politics. Ugly, of right. Christian ugly. Nationalism. ugly is a good word. to describe. It's ugly. Yeah. Something, something about Christianity in America, the Baptist evangelicals, ugly. Something it's become so corrupt. How else do you describe it? It's you know a I mean? shadow of what it was, right? Like, right. And it and it's it's it, it's you know, and now it's become reduced to magical thinking, right? You're creating a new mythologized past, right? And you're you're it's 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 appealing to the lowest common denominator. It's about you know, people are afraid of the change. They're afraid to move forward. They just want an answer. They just want a, a truth. They don't they don't want to die. But they just Jesus want to be told. to die. They just want to be told that it's all going to be okay. You're going to right. Go all right. you gotta do is believe in this one thing and but go there, to this there, pastor, give him your money, and he'll heal you. He'll touch you, put his hands on you, and heal you. Right. But that's not the truth. That is no, there is no way out there. That only leads to death, right? That leads to stay. In my mind, stagnation, that conservative ideal, is the absolute worst thing. It's directly opposed you know, to everything I stand for. You know, I just remind him, you're, you're, you remind me of Alan Watts because Alan Watts, he would kind of laugh at people. He, I forgot. He, there's a speech that I, I'm going to have to send it to you after this is over where he's talking about like when he would go to talk to like the highest Brahmins and yogis and 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 people in the in India and China and like the people who are really high up with very famous people. And then he'd have conversations with them. They don't believe in all the mystical stuff. They don't believe like they don't like some of them didn't even believe in reincarnation. But the people on the bottom of the caste system believe in it wholeheartedly. Like I'm going to die and I'm going to be reincarnated into another body. But he he thought it was interesting how the people who are on the top of these food chains are like no these are these are concepts that are deeper they're not exactly literal they mean something else like you're supposed to like they have different purpose than literally being true right well it's that was, it is, I think that's it's fascinating though it's fascinating how yeah. you get that the people on the bottom who are just like everyday workers and you know probably poor or something they believe in it like it gives them that like hope the people on the top are like no it's more philosophical than that it's not exactly literally true right and you see this across the board you see this process of like um demystification right where yeah. you, you take away all of the sacred and you dumb it down and it just it becomes this rigid authoritarian hierarchy what right. is it really right, right? Yeah. what's the essence what are these people really about you know and that's where it gets super problematic to me it's like you have to go through these levels 
Didn't he have to go through these experiences that have to be mitigated by someone? No, 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 no. That yeah. seems to me like uh, insanity, right? Right. right. Like yeah. when you look at the when you look at the early when the Vedas, they talk about the Rishis heard the voice. They just heard it, and the voice told them the sacrifice. You know, and Shiva says, "Just go out into the wilderness and call my name." Right. Wow. Like there's all of this stuff. Like there's the, you can shave your head. You can go out and commit yourself and you can achieve an enlightenment experience. Like you can do it on your own. That's the understanding in this cult, right? It's, it's yeah. so radically different than the religions that assert themselves on top of it. Right. And yeah. again, it's all about authority and control and, and, and about, about creating that rigid homogenized experience. Like, when I look at something like Christianity, what do I see, right? I see the marriage of two amazing ideas. You have pagan universalism and you have nationalism, right? And a singular deity. When you take these things together, you can create an extreme uniformity that can be applied to anyone, you know? And then you create a rigid hierarchical system, right? You have to go through us and you have to experience it the way we tell you to. Otherwise, it's not legit. It's, right. it's, it's, it's a methodology of control. And by that point, though, it's so removed from the original church that Jesus Christ is talking about. Like, it's Jesus gone. is a mystery guy. He's a mage. Yeah. He's running out in the in the woods saying that the end of the world is nigh, you know? Right, right. <laughs> right? right. Like, yeah, You don't have people like that in the church anymore who are... No. Well, like, you do have the apocalyptic stuff, but you don't have them, like... But again, like, even with the apocalyptic living stuff... Living poverty and all that stuff, they, yeah. they, they whitewash it. If you talk to modern priests nowadays, if anyone claims a miracle... Everyone comes out to disprove it. There can't be a miracle. Right. This is fucking bullshit. This is yeah. insane, right? They're all skeptics. And, you know, I understand where that comes from. It comes right. from this modernity, but it's just so weird to see in the, in the church. You know, yeah. It's funny. Yeah, that's a good play. Good point. Right? You're like, oh, they, no. they have telescopes. They're more scientific than just about anyone. You yeah, know? This, this is a different world now. This post-enlightening right? world world like, it really is. like i honestly believe if you were to take some christians and in in, in in like from the original time and introduce them to modern modern catholics or they, they think they were deists they think they were they yeah they'd be like this is <laughs> they don't believe in any of this stuff right, right. They, they wouldn't understand it even remotely it's <laughs> a good point um yeah i mean what else i'm trying to think of what else some of, some of these questions might might lead us yeah, into let's, uh, let's answer some questions yeah so thank you for this super chat uh, has anyone claimed to met Allah on DMT? Hmm, this is an interesting one. So um, I don't know about DMT, but it's really interesting within the Sufi traditions, you have all this discussion of wine and you have this sacred element of the wine, specifically within Turkey and in parts of Greece, right? And what kind of wine are they drinking, right? Is it an infused wine? Is it a Dionysian wine? And at what? the same time, right, they're doing drumming rituals and they're doing ecstatic dance rituals. They're producing DMT in their pineal glands. So even if they're not engaging in plant medicine, the Sufi mystics are meeting the Allah on DMT. <laughs> they're just doing it in a different way, in yeah, a natural way. Experiencing Allah instead of meeting him, yeah. I guess well, that would, what yeah. it is, is it's like, you know, they're doing an internal alchemy. When you see these, when you see the Sufis and they're doing their dances and they're spinning to exhaustion and they're breathing heavy, what do you think you're doing? Right. Yeah. That's right? Interesting. Yeah. I like that question. I never thought about it like that. But that, not, but that brings up another thing is when you experience a uh, psychedelic experience, maybe not even just DMT, but maybe DMT, if does your, does your personal worldview whether you're a Christian or you're a Buddhist, or you're, does that affect, I think I'm saying, I say yes. Does that affect how you experience the trip? Oh, I would, I would say so a hundred, a hundred percent, because when you talk to people, what they experience is based upon their own preconceptions, right? Like right. I feel like what's happening is that all of this is produced in the mind, right? It's an akin to a dream experience. So it's very personal. It's very individualized. Like it can be guided through symbolism of a culture, Right. But it is individual. It's really interesting if you talk to a lot of modern magicians, because then it gets weird. What are them? Who are the modern magicians contacting to contacting the chaos guys? They're talking to Batman. They're talking to Superman. You know, they're talking to icons of the dream world of pop culture. And they're summoning them in the same way. And they're still having these same ecstatic experiences. Right. I don't think it's, it's any different. 
you're still yeah. reacting to the same energies. They're just interpreted through a different cultural lens. Interesting. Jason Sobek, Lord of the Four Corners, from one lord to another. <laughs> Good to see you, Sobek. <laughs> Good to see you, Sobek. Also, also, he just dropped a new video today on the channel. We are being transformed. Great video. I helped him edit check it. Check it out, everyone. Yeah, it's great. Um, let me see what else we got. Uh, here we go. Yellow Psych in the house. I love mushrooms. And not even necessarily taking them, but just them existing. <laughs> nice. Shout out to all the mushrooms out there. Right? Like, mushrooms are so important. And I, it's it makes me so happy that in our current culture, we're seeing this um, rise of acceptance and this understanding of their place within our within our world. Like, my, my first big breakthrough um, was through meditation. But then what confirmed it was a mushroom experience. So... I find meditation is really hard to achieve really deep states. It requires like a lot of persistence and in, 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 in intention. So like for me, I was able to achieve a state after meditating for like nine and a half hours straight. Okay. Without moving. And what I experienced was myself becoming one with the universe, then breaking apart infinitely into its complete abstraction. And then over again. But when I, meditated, when I meditated, it happened once and it, it was like a, it was this empowering, blissed out experience, but then it was gone. Mm -hmm. On mushrooms, it was like it grabbed me by the throat and it made me experience this over and over again in waves for like four hours. So it was wave upon wave of the many to the one, to the many, to the one, to the many, to the one. But it's like wow. you go. And I mean, like, I literally felt myself separated and ripped apart to every single molecule to where I became infinite, one with every point in the universe. Like there was no perception and infinitely separate and then infinitely one. And like, I don't know how to explain it. It's like an intrinsic knowledge. It's not really, a perception. You know, it really is a powerful experience to to go These through. DMT effects, they take over your entire body. Well, for know? some for some people, it could be life changing. Like it could be. Yeah. This is something that I just I don't know. Maybe it's maybe it's maybe it's the drug. Maybe it's not. But they, they don't. It doesn't matter at that point. The what, what they felt, what they experienced was that was was it like it happened. So it's like it's pretty interesting like for, stuff. Like for me, it was a confirmation. Right. It, it, it made all the meditation mean something. And mm. it also it was like. Now I know what I'm kind of looking for and I, I want to go beyond it, right? Like I want to have communication, right? Like if you talk, if you listen to people who are on ayahuasca, like the ayahuasca Leros, they have full on communication, right? The same thing with the Vudan priests, like people oh, yeah. are out there talking with intelligences outside of themselves. And the question mm -hmm. is, that's the question. Is it, is it something deep within yourself that you're getting at some subconscious entity within yourself or is it something something else you know that's that's the question but you know what i want to i want to throw this out there because he was talking about them existing the biggest living organism on the planet right now is a mycelium patch somewhere in the i think i want to say alaska or something i can't remember where it's in, um, it's in canada it's british columbia yeah yeah and there's this giant chunk miles long of yeah. one one entity it's so the weird. largest the largest single organism that ever lived ever lived was one mycelium that it was called the great plane maker it stretched from alberta almost all the way to florida now why why is it called the great plane maker because that I, that's it killed that, that, like it destroyed forests and turned them into planes over over yeah. thousands and thousands of years so this is what they were saying i, mean, I have an image of like what they look like underground and so they would There'd be miles of these things. And oh, whoops, I got to delete this. And they form symbiotic relationships with themselves and the yeah, trees, they, can, and they have they, dialogues. They're, very, they're conversating. They're a, they're a very um, intelligent as far as like the capacities. Um, they can take ecosystems like trees and br break them down and like produce water and all types of weird, crazy, like uh, ecosystem changing stuff, basically. Yeah, so, there's a there's a dialogue that's happening between them and the trees, you know. Right, that's what that's what they were saying. There's some something going on with that. That's interesting stuff. I want to get someone on who's an expert on that stuff and really ask them about that stuff because that's just mind blowing. Right? It's stuff. mind blowing. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that super chat. Uh, you know, it's like Max the Confessor. What's the role of imagination in the Vedic traditions? 
in Eastern Orthodoxy, imagination is prohibited in prayer. So by extension, psychedelics too. Mm. Um, I mean, so you get this whole tradition of dhyana, which is concentration. Um, and yeah, that's about eliminating the imaginative. It's about fixating yourself onto a certain point. But there's still a lot of this imaginative stuff that's happening. It's just happening through a yoga kind of process. So there's, I don't ever see like an elimination, like maybe within some sex, they're like, no, 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 you can't have any images of any kind. But usually what you'll see is actually you want to project the image of your God, of the God into your third eye. You want to visualize these things. You want to um, have an imaginative con connection with what you're focusing on. So often you'll see things like yantras, which are two-dimensional drawings that are meant to be projected into three-dimensional space with your mind, you know? And they'll, they'll form these like cube-like objects. If you get right into meditation, you can actually make them like disembody out of the shape and appear in front of you. It's, uh, it's There's some really powerful stuff going on in all of this yoga. And it's deeply imaginative, but it's a restricted imagination, right? They're not just telling you to sit and let your mind run wild. If What they do is they tell you to do that until your mind runs out, until it stops talking, and then real dhyana can take place, real conversation. Yeah, good point. That's a really interesting point. Thank you, Melody, for that. If you're enjoying the stream, hit the like. But um, I didn't mean to jump off that question. I was just I just wanted to throw that up there because I saw it. No, but, it's good. Uh, but yeah, it seems like there's um, no, that's I didn't know, I actually had nothing to add to that. That I think you said that pretty well. Um, yeah. like, there's it's like you do yeah. get these, you do get these like um, so within the Vedanta tradition later on, you get this concept called of, of, of Advaita Vedanta, and then especially within modernity, you now see a lot of people who are like this, where they're the idea is all about God is neti neti, he's not this, not that. So it can't be anything that you can conceive that you can project. So to project any kind of imagination upon deity is to corrupt deity. So you do see this, but it's in very much a uh, limited monastic sex within the highest echelons of, of yoga. Like the average Indians aren't thinking like this. Maybe some guys who are reading the philosophy, but not, not your average practitioner. Most people are imagining their deities in their third eye, you know? Wow. Thank you. Jason Stewart, thank you for the super chat. Is the forbidden fruit of Eden pine cones, pineal? Well, uh, we do have the pineal gland represented by the pine cone in the cult of Dionysus. We do have the pineal gland represented as the eye of Horus. And we do also have, have the Catholic Church that had the staff with the pine cone on it. The right. Pope, Pope holds and it. then we have the we have um, we have a lot of this stuff with throughout the Indian tradition in various tantricas and various symbols as well. It's very clear that these people are aware of the pineal gland. They're aware of the production of DMT and they're purposefully going through physical alchemy in order to produce more DMT, whether that's the ingestion of drugs or it's like uh, physical exertion in music, you know. Yeah, I just wanted to show something real quick. This is actually kind of mind blowing because and on one hand. In the Catholic Church, you have you have this staff. Now it's not on top, like the thri the Dionysus is called the Thrysis, where he holds the staff with the pine cone on top. This one you see it, it looks like it's like almost to the top, but there's a cross over it. Do you think there's a connection there? Um, yeah. I mean it it, it seems very clear to me. Like you gotta remember that all of this symbolism is building off of older symbolism, right? And they're they're keeping the pompousness of it all as a way to try and make sure that they're still like inspiring the people. So even if it's not a direct connection, they're 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 keeping that connection for that point, you know. You ready for this? This is gonna blow your mind. All right, everybody, check this out. Now that we've seen the Dionysian side, but what about the Hermetic side? See the caduces. This is the Syrian patriarch. Also, in both, not only the Syrian patriarch, but the the Greek, the Greek patriarch and the Coptic patriarch have a similar staff with the two intertwined serpents, like a caduceus of Hermes. So right. you're like what you just said. The symbolism is still there. And I, you have to you have to wonder that guy right there was holding that staff. Do you think he thinks about that? Like, do you think he thinks about Hermes, or do you think he doesn't even care? No, I don't think he's thinking about Hermes at all, right? Yeah, like, so. These I guys train awesome. themselves to only think about God, especially like the really high priests and stuff, right? Like these are guys who are engaging in 24-7 Jesus prayer type stuff. 
yeah, they lost that connection to what these symbolism, what these symbols. Well, it's also it's like you got to look at the traditions and the practices that like these these kind of practices where you're constantly fixating on something. They 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 block everything else out. You know. <laughs> yeah, that's that Apollo, Apollonian uh, stage. Yellow Psych, thank you for the super chat. Is Shiva? This Shiva is the wild man of Europe. The sad. I, I honestly, I think a hundred percent. If you go now and you look up um, the Pashupati seal from Harappa, and then you look up, there's um, another seal that they found. I think it's Poland in Europe, but it's the same wild man figure. The horns are there. The yoga pose is there. The Amnita Muscara mushrooms are there, right? And then we have a direct connection to the North traditions and to this. This, the, the same rituals and the same proto Aryan uh, religious ideas, right? Like it's very clear in my conception that Odin is this Shiva Saturn figure again, right? He's slaying his grandfather to create the universe. He's sacrificing himself to gain the magic, right? He's the embodiment of time, but he's also intoxicating it. Like it, the parallels are all there. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to pull up with this guy. So this particular image right here, this is the wild man, um, horned wild man. Do you know how old mm -hmm. it is? I have no idea. I just pulled it up. Yeah, that's a. I'm not sure about that particular one, but that's a particularly old one. I'm just gonna look up this Pashupati seal. Where is it? Poland. Yeah. Let's see if you can find this. No. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I can't find it right now, but. Um, okay. Um, anyway. Yeah, sure. No, no big deal. Yeah, you definitely see these parallels, though, with this wild man figure, right? This, yeah. These guys who are going out, growing their hair long, and, and tripping on mushrooms, right? <laughs> yeah, just give me one second. got to fix my camera, but I'm going to pull up yeah. the next super chat. Thank you for that, Yellow Psych. Appreciate it. There's, like, I think, a couple more. Yeah, Not shout out to Mateus. Thank you so much. Yeah. There we go. Oh, Ted Francis. Wow. Thank you, Ted, for the super chat. Thoughts on the Dao Di Jin and is it? Well, Dao is really interesting because you see all these parallels of yogic techniques and some of them are coming from the Buddhist tradition. Like there's a clear dialogue, like we have um, uh, comparative things to the Soma, like you see the Goma in Japan and stuff. Um, but what's interesting with the Dao De Jin, what's happening in China is you're seeing this physical alchemy that's arriving that's similar to the Indian, but is also separate i think like it's a tradition like I, I feel like they're reacting to the same ideas and they're coming to similar conclusions but there also are these similar kind of nomadic peoples that are moving into india as well um i love the Dao De Jing. i really think yeah. that it's 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 getting into the same kind of non-dual primordial understanding you see so many parallels like with the the dharma this idea of the way within the within yeah, indian the religions the, or right? be, to be like water, to flow with the flow with exactly. your, your nature well, and what's around you. Like you the know. Dharma idea within India takes on a lot of different ideas, but it's still the central idea is that within this incarnation, there's something that you're meant to do. You have a responsibility. You have you have something that you're meant to achieve, and it is your duty to go out and do that. You know, and within the Tao, it's it, it doesn't have that same kind of dutyness, but you get this idea of being in balance and being in harmony. If you're living your best life, you're harming not, you know, you're leaving in peace with the universe and you're doing what you're meant to do, you know? So it's a very similar philosophy. Yeah, it's definitely. Now, would you consider it to be, because this is Chinese uh, tradition, would you consider it to be coming out of the Vedic uh, no, no, no I, I wouldn't think so either. No, like like China has um, one of the earliest sites for the uh, for for growing of cannabis and the utilization of cannabis. So we even think that maybe cannabis use originates in China and then comes to India later. And like I said, like the Chinese culture is so old. There's, there's just like there's a huge problem when we're looking at ancient Chinese literature, because the first of the four emperors went around burning all of the ancient texts that he didn't like. So we have this complete lack of information. So we have a lot of inscriptions and we have a lot of sites, but we don't have the textual evidence to really talk about how old this is. We have a lot of later stuff that's referencing potentially old material, you know? Yeah. But I there's clearly what... something happening originally in China. We just, we don't have, and also like, I'm not an expert in Chinese. I only know this from an undergraduate level, right? Yeah. Um. I can't remember which one it was. I'm trying to pull it up. One of the 
what are they called? They're not called suras. They're called something else in the Tao Te Ching. They're called like whatever the books. Mm -hmm. like to. And one yeah. of them does reference one of the gods. I'm not sure if it was Shiva or Krishna. But well, you know, the Tao is traditional Taoism, especially after Lao Tzu, right? Like, so you get the Tao Te Ching of Lao Tzu, which is his sayings. And the and the story goes is that he was trying to leave China, and guards stopped him, and they demanded that he write his stuff down basically. And then right. he went off in his way and he's kind of like this green man figure, this immortal. It's like he's probably living in the Himalayas somewhere, according to Tao tradition, right? But yeah. later commentaries upon the Tao and later Taoist writing is immersed within the Chinese folk religion, you know? It's completely um, like central to that folk religion too. Like if you go to Chinese temples, the Tao is there, you know? Yeah trying to see what else what other questions we had that's the last for super chats but now i'm just going to look to see if there's any questions that maybe people have that i can uh we can answer uh let me see if anyone wants to throw one up there i can right now let me see oh here we go is saint matt using baron samdi and bridget as their Vag bhagavad Sh shiva hmm I don't really know what that. I'm not sure what Saint Matt is. Saint Matthew? Oh no, Santa Mont. Okay, yeah, yeah. So they're talking about voodoo here. So okay. uh, the Gay Day cult. Yeah, yeah. This is um, this is in my opinion very much related to that same Shiva Saturn kind of idea, right? So Gay Day Nebo or Baron Samdi. Yeah, this is your your Saturnian figure, right? It's really yeah. interesting within the Yoruba religions and within Vudan because you have parallel conceptions. You have like the positive version of the gods and then you have the negative version of the god um i'm not as deep into vudan as i'd like um but they're, they're they're clear in my mind reacting to the same kind of destruction violence kind of understanding and this sexual tantra that's going on you see similar parallels across vudan yeah i just wanted to pull this up because somebody asked what's his youtube so i just pulled it up lord snappy Looking yeah, so right. I do. I do on my YouTube. I'm doing body percussion, you know. So like uh, I studied on with the uh, doing Brazilian and African percussion, and that's mostly what this channel is dedicated to. Um, if please come on to the Discord if you want to to discuss oh, yeah. this kind of stuff. Um, I moderate the the Myth and Lore Discord along with Mateus Yellow Psych, who's been commenting here, and we want to have as much of this kind of esoteric discussion as possible. You know, like. Uh, we're really interested in exploring and probing the deaths of comparative mythology. <laughs> Absolutely. McCrinan with the soup with the question, it was the yin goddess from before the impersonalization, and that it's probably analogous to Durga Ma. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm not sure a hundred percent what you mean with the yin goddess i don't know too much about the yin goddess but you know like durga ma right that's the the mother uh embody but it's the mother in her fierce protector form so that's shakti energy as this motherly protector she's that energy of defending my children at all costs oh so it's I, not the complete chaos of kali you know yeah i looked it up and there actually is a god in china called Kan kuan yin and it's a sanskrit god so it is proto oh, interesting proto chinese but also there's, part of china there's so, yeah, so much in I, yeah i would say mccrinan's out of something there yeah sure. probably i i wouldn't be surprised right there's like there's so much cross-cultural dialogue and it's something that a lot of people don't talk about is that the hindus were proselytizing at one point and we're moving their way into south asia like we have right hindu groups that were existing in thailand in champa in indonesia you know across those islands like yeah and then yeah. buddhism proselytizes everywhere makes its way all the way to egypt right right and um Alexander the Great, when he got to India, they thought that was the end of the world. They thought that was India, and that's it. When they got there, and they realized that there was a war, like they call it the Warring States period, and it's right, it's right three hundred. I know, I think it's like it's after that, but anyways, it's like it's like three hundred BC to three hundred AD, like, but like right before that is where Alexander's coming in. But they were still very like much of a warrior society in China, and they found out like through the intel. If they kept going, they're gonna get stomped out. Like they're 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 not gonna make it. And so that was finally when Alexander the Great said, All right, fine, we'll go home. He wanted to keep going. Of course but, he did. He was a total crazy man. <laughs> yeah. King 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 Porus and his uh elites were like, Listen, 
we we you know you you sort of did subdue us in a way but we're just gonna tell you straight up if you keep going you're done like you're not gonna you're not gonna conquer china and then he's like all right fine <laughs> <laughs> so which is kind of it's kind of a cool story though but um oh, for sure right thank you for that super chat or question i should say uh, let me see if there's any more i don't see anything else ariel has a question okay where are you at ariel i don't see it ariel ask it again oh here it is snappy was the serpent in the garden the shining part of nakash was there chromodome or is that chromosome the shining part of Nakash. I'm not sure what he means by the shining part of Nakash or Chrome Dome. <laughs> Sorry, uh, uh, Ariel. Was the serpent in the garden, the shining part of Nakash, was their chromosome? I don't know what that means either, but I know that the Nakash is serpent in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. Okay. I know like um, uh, Shiva is the serpent, right? He's the, he's the lord of the Nagas. Um, there's all this imagery of awakening the serpent, right? The Parvati is, is, is seen as the Kundalini. Uh, yeah. Here, I think there's another one, actually. Okay. There's a lot of comments, so I'm not really mm -hmm. seeing where... Can you just ask it one more time, uh, Ash, um, Ariel? I can't find it right now. But uh, here, it says, Moses, Jethro, Samson, David, please address Shivaite and Nazarite connections, as well as the green man in the Bible. Yeah, so there's definite parallels with this green man, the wild man of Europe, um, Enoch, and like you see the same green man in the Quran as well. Uh, this the and and within the Greek myths of Dionysus, right? This figure who exists in the wild that comes out and reveals to 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 certain people mysteries, usually a pant, a plant mystery, and he's like an, an immortal figure, right? Who comes and he tells you things, and then he returns back to the wilderness. Now. Every time in the myths, this is basically what Shiva is. He's this wild man who exists off in the mountains, specifically Mount Kailash. And there are all these stories of people wandering through the wilderness and he just appears when you need him, you know, or he appears after you do extreme austerity and drugs. <laughs> wow. Interesting. Now I'm just trying to uh, fix my thing real quick, but... Uh... Also find... with the, the Nazarite yeah. thing, right? So the Shaivites, they are doing a Nazaritic oath as well. So you see this parallel here. They're refusing to cut the hair, right? It's unshown hair, usually with the Shavites. They've sworn to let their hair mat into locks, right? And oh, you see, the, see the same oh, thing yeah. with Samson. Go ahead, Thor. No, that, that's a good point. But I just want I didn't want to uh miss Mr. Crying said. Gnostic for it didn't get what I was talking about, but the guest isn't so much more well informed. <laughs> no, that's I don't know everything, you know. Uh, it's it's that, hard when you're dealing with a, an entire world, right? With all these religions. Like I don't know half the stuff that Neil knows about the Hellenic world. Okay. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and, then, and then I don't even know half the stuff as some other people do. So it's a, there's right? so much stuff that's out there. It's ancient history and ancient mythology that nobody if anyone nope. says they knew it all, they're I'm, they're a liar. Like I would immediately laugh at that person if they're 100%. like, "I know everything." I would just say, "You don't. You're just foolish. You're, you're foolish. Yeah. You're fooling yourself." <laughs> but, and that's another thing is when people ask me something I don't know, I just say, "I don't know. I have no idea." I'm not, not going to pretend to like give you a, some random, like vague answer. I'll just say, "I don't know." You know? Right. But, but yeah, good point though. Jason Sobek, Lord of the Four Corners. Here's mine. What does Lord Snappy think of the parallels between the Eastern sages and we were just talking about this and the Ablican and Neoplatonic theology before you say anything on top of that layer? Because that's a really good comparison. That's the later sages. But the earlier sages you have at the same time you have uh, Pythagoras is living and possibly Zoroaster is living in Persia and also um, Confucius in China. So across the whole continent. You have three of the greatest thinkers in world history living on the planet at the same time, and they don't even know each other. Right. That's well, crazy. Within India, this period of 600 BCE to about 200, some say 100 BCE, is like the flooring of such incredible philosophy, the birth of the epics, the birth of Buddhism, of Jainism, of uh, the Kalipa Muni, of Patanjali, of the Upanishads. There's such this incredible flourishing of knowledge, and it's all based around the idea of the sacrifice, 
no longer being reserved for the highest echelons, the rituals being dispersed, the yoga being practiced by these individual people and the syncretization that happens that allows these people to influence and to talk philosophically among these other schools. You get all of this dialogue where people are competing and they're, they're, it's not like an all out war, right? Like these are people who are having these different philosophical ideas and are fighting. Like one of my favorites about this is like, even after the Jain philosophy stops being relevant in India and it's starting to be on a serious decline, a lot of the kings keep the Jains around because they have this philosophy called Anekantavada, which literally means many-sidedness. Because what's central to the idea of Jain creation is that the one becomes many to have perspective. And that truth itself can only be understood through multiple perspective. So it's only when we all come together as a whole and we have a larger number of perspectives that we can ever get closer to the truth. And this is where you get that really classic Indian story of the uh, monks all grabbing the elephant, right? They're all blind. And you have one monk who's grabbing the tail and he says, oh, this is like a snake. Another monk grabs the leg and he says, this is like a tree trunk, right? And then another grabs the tusk and says, this is like a walrus. They're mm. all wrong, yet they're all right. And he kind of Anna tells us that it's only when you get them all together that they come together. This philosophy had such sweeping impact across India that it literally meant that the kings would listen to everyone. They would bring in all the various philosophical people and have them debate. You know, so you get yeah. this incredible thriving. And you see the same thing happening in the East, right? Yeah. With the Neoplatonism and all of this yeah. talk when, when, when the East and the West start to meet, you know? Well, this is the thing. You mentioned how the kings in the east are keeping the, the Jainists around. Well, you have in the Christian Byzantine Empire, you have basically there's no more paganism, but the Neoplatonists are still laying around. In fact, some of the sages might be living right next to, in the same quarters is uh is like whatever king, whatever emperor was reigning, Constantine VI or whatever. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Throwing names out there. But there'd be like some Neoplatonist philosophers still in, around in the king, in the court of the emperor in, in Constantinople. Why? Because, you know, why and not? Also, why, you want that wisdom to be around you. You want to hear the other people, you know? I also see direct parallels between the Neoplatonic theurgy that's happening and the development of the yoga bhakti tradition. So bhakti is something, it comes out more of the, the Indian Middle Ages, but it's this, it's the divine worship. It's this idea of throwing yourself into, it's, it's dualistic in its approach largely, but these people, it's the worship of God that becomes the central thing. Engaging in the, in the, in the love and engaging in this, you have to give yourself over to the God. You have to embody the God. You'll even see um, bhakti sages, like the famous one would be, uh, what's his name? Oh, my God. The, found, uh, the founder of Godaya Vishnavism, which is like the largest branch of Vaishnavism, the, like the modern Hare Krishnas follow them. Their original founder used to be possessed by the spirit of Radha who's the lover of Krishna. And then he would engage in lusting after God. So like he would lust after God in the way a teenage girl lusts after a crush. And this was seen as like the highest pursuit of the divine. It, like you wanted to make love to the divine, right? Like within these traditions, it's like love becomes this, this erotic experience, right? Like you're supposed to by having this erotic emotion and by having this passion for the deity, you bring the deity out in and of yourself. The deity possesses you. Your body becomes a temple unto God, you know? Yeah. Now, someone yellow psych set, dropped a super chat that the Discord link is broken. Um, is that oh, that's no. the case? I'm clicking on it on mine. I'm going right. It's bringing me right to the Discord. So I maybe, knew that those links expire really quickly. Okay, so what I'll do is if anyone wants, if Ariel help me out and send me the right link, I'll put it, I'll switch it up right now or as soon as I get off this course. Um, or I mean the course, uh, this live. But I think there might have been one more question. I can't remember if there was or not, but that might be it. But let me just see. Yeah. Oh, here, this might be a question right here. Why the de facto dislike of psychedelics as legitimate means for visionary experiences, though? Young snaps, all roads, et cetera. Honestly, like, I think it's this, um, it's it's about maintaining control, hierarchical control. Um, there's it basically, psychedelic experience is extremely hard to regulate. Everyone's going to have something different, you know? So what you do is you occlude it. 
You take the drug and you put it within a right and you you make it ever, ever and more mysterious and more layered. And then you just remove the drug entirely and you still have the whole system in place and people still believe in it, even though there, there, there's now there's nothing at the end of it. Right. It's a it's a it's, a, it's all about systematic control. And how do you assist? Because they want you to experience their interpretation. They want you to believe in their legal framework of how to function in society. They don't want you to trip and see God and come up with something yourself. Absolutely. Great point. Um, that's it for questions. So that was great. Dude, this honestly, this was really fun, man. Like, yeah, this, this is amazing. Yeah, I think we'll uh, definitely do more of these and keep the discord link. If, if it's not working right now, I'm going to have fix it within the next five, 10 minutes. So it will be fixed. And, and uh, I'll be over on the discord link. Like if people want to come chat with me afterwards, you know, yeah, we'll, yeah we'll I'll be over there soon. too. I'll be over there too. I'll jump over there as well. And also don't forget snappy's channel, hit the subscribe button. Do you plan on doing any more content anytime soon? Yeah, or not? Um, I, I probably will. I've been more active on TikTok as of late. Oh, um, see, I don't, I don't have TikTok, so I can't log in. But yeah, but the thing too is like happy. I've been moving a little bit away from the music and more focusing on this. I hope to get uh, my own esoteric podcast started in the near yeah, future. So no, keep you your really, eyes open. You absolutely have what it takes. For oh, that. thank you. <laughs> you really, you really need to, you need to get on that, and I'll help you out as much as I can as well. Really like, appreciate if that. There's I can, if there's anything I can offer, like I got of you. Of course, um, whatever you can, right? <laughs> definitely. So. But that being said, um, I'm just checking to make sure anything else is on there. Oh, here's the Discord link. Thank you, Sobek, for that. I'll leave that up as I hit the outro. And like I always say, you have just attained true gnosis. You have just attained true gnosis. The Demiurge has no power over you.